Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along to this exciting first uh, hustings, online hustings for the Conservative Party. And we are in a very serious situation for our party and our country. But don't lose heart. If you choose me, I'll be the first Prime Minister we've ever had who has a background as an entrepreneur. That means negotiation is what I did every single day of my life. And right now, we've got to negotiate our way outside this crisis. And I will do that by being someone who the EU will engage with, but also someone who doesn't blink and someone who's prepared to walk away if uh, we don't get what we need. I'm also uh, someone who, as Foreign Secretary, wants Britain to walk tall in the world. My dad was in the Navy. I followed him around the country from Plymouth to Portsmouth from Surrey to Scotland, and I know how important Britain is as a country that upholds democratic values across the world. And that's why I've said I will increase our defence spending to beyond 2% of GDP, on top of our 0.7% aid commitment, because I want us to send a signal to the world at the point of Brexit that the Britain that has had such a crucial role in defending both our security and the values we believe in. That Britain is here, it's back, and our voice is going to be loud. I'll also be the first Prime Minister who's been responsible for our NHS. We Conservatives should always have a social mission. And I want our next social mission to be education. Nearly a quarter of our primary school leavers still don't reach the right standard for reading and writing. And I want us to be the Conservative government that abolishes illiteracy and really says the party of opportunity is going to make sure that every single young person has opportunities as they start out on their life. And finally, politics is about winning elections. And I'm a campaigner. I'll be the first prime minister for half a century to have won a marginal seat. And I make two promises. By the time we fight an election again, I will get more young people to vote conservative as the party of aspiration yeah. We need to have young people on board. And secondly, I won't fight an election until we've left the European Union, because uh, to do so would be absolutely fatal for our party. Uh, the crocodile lurking under the water of British politics is the most hard left, dangerous, anti-British, anti-Western Labour Party we have ever had. It would be a total betrayal of our country and our values to let them anywhere near Downing Street, and I never will. Thank you very much. Right, let's get straight to some questions then. People have been writing in uh, already. Um, one here on the unity of the Union of the United Kingdom. Clovis says on Facebook, how do you propose to unite all the countries in the UK after Brexit so that we stay together? Well, I don't want to... Um go so far as to say I'm the living embodiment of the Union, but I do have Welsh blood and I have Irish blood and I had two very happy years of my childhood in Scotland. And I just want to be very straightforward about this. I will never allow our Union to be broken up. Never, never, never. I want to just, I want to give a specific on this though, because I think it is important I think we were complacent before the 2014 independence referendum in Scotland. Uh, we had what felt like a close shave at the time. And I think we've been complacent after that referendum. We need to be constantly thinking about how to strengthen the bonds of our union. And I want to make sure that we're doing that. Okay, Jim on Facebook has written in to say, as you have uh, both held the office of foreign secretary, uh, what, uh, both, both candidates, that is, what do you consider to be our greatest current international security threat and what is our greatest international economic opportunity post-Brexit? Well, it's a very good question. And I, the, the biggest threat at the moment is clearly the tension in the Middle East. And as Foreign Secretary, you wake up every morning uh, worrying about that. And, um, you know, this situation is not one where either... Iran or the United States wants a war. But a bit like with World War I, sometimes the most terrible conflicts can be triggered by accident. And that's what we have to absolutely make sure does not happen. But I think the bigger strategic challenge, because I think a job of a foreign secretary is always to look 
beyond the next few months to the next few years and the next few decades is the rise of China. And we don't know really which direction China is going to go in. Um, it's not a democracy. We don't share all their values. But we want China to be a terrific success and we want to be friends with them. And I uh, spend a lot of time thinking about China, not just because of my wife, got the nationality right. Um, uh, but I spend a lot of time thinking about China because I think that is something that uh, we need to get right and we need to find a way to live alongside China as it grows. On the question of Iran, you've said recently that you stand by, that we stand by the United States. Does that mean to the detriment of the relationship that the UK has with European allies going forward? Well, actually, on Iran, we have a disagreement with the United States. We signed up to the Iran nuclear deal, which the United States originally signed up to and then came out. And, and I do very strongly believe that today the situation would be a whole lot more dangerous if Iran had nuclear weapons. So on that, we have a, a disagreement with the United States administration. But what I never have a disagreement with the United States is what President Trump said when he came here just a few weeks ago for the D-Day celebrations. He said that the alliance between the United States and the United Kingdom is the greatest in history. And I think we always need to remember that there are no countries that have done more than our two countries to defend freedom, human rights, the rule of law, our values. And that's why we should always treat that relationship as absolutely sacred. President Trump also made some comments about the NHS when he was over as well, and um, some controversial ones. Nigel on Facebook says, do you believe in the NHS concept of treatment free at the point of demand? Yes, I do. And actually, Nigel, the most popular tweet I've ever done was one when I uh, took on President Trump when I was health secretary and uh, disagreed with something that he'd said about the NHS. Um, I think this is part of our DNA in this country. My, my dad brought me up saying that one of the best things about Britain was it doesn't matter who you are, rich or poor, north or south, young or old, city or countryside, you don't have to worry if you can't afford health care because in this country it's free. And we're, I think, one of the first countries in the world to introduce universal health coverage. And since then, most of the rest of the world has wanted to follow suit. And I think we can be really proud of what the NHS stands for across the world. What was it that President Trump said in that tweet that you disagreed with? And how would you address concerns about creeping privatization? Well, you know, I was health uh, secretary for uh, longer than anyone else has been. And I think the proportion of NHS money spent on the private sector went up by one or two percent. I mean, it was a tiny, tiny fraction, sort of six percent to seven percent or something like that from, from memory. Um, so there's no privatization agenda. In fact, we took the power to decide that away from politicians and gave it to doctors on the front line. What, what President Trump saw was some demonstrations uh, for the NHS uh, in London, I think. And he tweeted, this shows that the NHS is, uh, is a national disaster or something like that. So I said, no, these people, even though they probably disagree with me, probably even a few placards saying they disagree with me, um, they are actually demonstrating because they love the NHS. And uh, so he, w he misunderstood what they were saying. Let's get back to some more questions then. Jonathan on Twitter has said, both of you have talked about securing the rights of EU citizens no matter how we leave. What talks have you or will you have to make sure the rights of British citizens in the EU are also protected on day one? Well, I've been as Foreign Secretary responsible for having discussions with all European countries about the rights of Brits um, in European countries. And um, they've all said that they want to make sure that, uh, that Brits are able to carry on uh, about a million, just under a million uh, living and working in EU countries as they do now. Um, if we had a no deal situation, uh, then it becomes more difficult. I will give full rights to the three million Europeans in this country. They do a fantastic job. I mean, I saw what, uh, you know, the uh, 20,000 nurses, 10,000 doctors from the EU, what the, con the contribution they make is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I believe that most European countries would reciprocate in that situation. I think they, they would do the right thing. But of course, you can't guarantee that. A question about infrastructure now. Alex on Facebook has said, as Prime Minister, would your government support major transport infrastructure projects like HS2, 
and the, the third runway at Heathrow. Well, I'm aware that what I'm going to say now is not going to be popular with all Conservative Party members, um, but I will back the third runway and I will back HS2 because <laughs> if the Conservative Party is not the party for the whole country, we are nothing. And I think it is absolutely essential at the point of Brexit that we show some confidence to the rest of the world. And HS2 is our biggest infrastructure project. What would it say to the whole world if we, if we paused it or said we weren't going to do it anymore? It would say, you know, has this country lost its mojo? And I want us to be the fastest growing, most dynamic, most exciting, uh, greenest, most high-tech country in Europe. And uh, for that, we've got to have these big projects. Um, back to party politics now, really. Um, Peter on Twitter says, if you become Prime Minister, how confident are you that you can beat Corbyn and Farage at the next general election with a healthy majority? Well, I'm, I'm very confident. I'm a campaigner. But, you know, if we have an election before we've left the European Union, it doesn't matter how brilliant a campaigner, it doesn't matter how charismatic a leader you are, we will be thrashed and we'll put Corbyn in Downing Street. So my absolute commitment is that I won't provoke a general election until we've left the European Union. But once we have, and I believe we can, and I believe I can negotiate an exit from the EU, and I've said I'll leave without a deal if that's the only way to leave. But once we have, then uh, there is so much opportunity for us to put Corbyn back in, its, in his place. Because the truth is that all the things that Corbyn talks about, uh, you know, standing up for people on low incomes. The party that actually does that is the Conservative Party, which was the party, <laughs> which was the party that uh, introduced the national living wage, which is the party that's created a thousand jobs every single day that it's been in office, which is the party that's got house building up to near record levels. It's the Conservative Party. And we don't just talk the talk when it comes to social justice, we walk the walk. If, if the key to general election success is winning over those voters who've turned to the Brexit Party, then how do you intend to win them back? It's very, very simple. The only way to win back voters who've gone to the Brexit party is to Brexit. We've just got to get on with it and then we'll get them back. But then how do you encourage, how do you reassure people that you're not just going to seek extension after extension because you have said that you are open to, to perhaps going further than October 31st and Halloween? There's very little difference in practice between my position and that of Boris. I have said it's true that if we got to uh, the last week of October, we had a deal with the European Union, there was some legislation going through the House of Commons, it hasn't quite got through. I'm not gonna rip it all off, rip it all up and leave without a deal. Um, but- honest with the British public about that as to whether a deal was feasible and likely. Look, we're all gonna know by the time we get to October, if there is a deal to be done, uh, we will know that. And I have been very clear and I've said in this leadership campaign that if we get to October and there is no prospect of a deal, then I'm prepared to leave without a deal. I will leave without a deal. And I will, as Prime Minister, have the mandate to do that because I've said so ahead of being elected. But I, I would do so with a heavy heart because of the risks to businesses up and down the country and uh, the risks to our union. But in the end, you know, I'm Foreign Secretary. I've been to 29 countries as Foreign Secretary in the last year. And everywhere I go, people respect this country because we are one of the most robust democracies in the world. And what does that mean? We're a country where people like me do what people like you tell us to do. And that means we're going to leave the European Union because that is what the democratic wish of the people was. A question of character now, which has obviously come up quite a lot over the last week or so. Alex on Twitter says, everyone has their own faults. Could you explain how you would mitigate the potential damage caused by your own? Very good question from Alex. Very... Uh, Except that everyone does indeed have their faults. I certainly have, uh, I certainly have plenty of faults. Um, and uh, so um, that's why I think it's very important that you know, this leadership campaign does not become one where we, we talk about uh, 
uh, each other's personalities. Um, talk about the decisions you'd take as prime minister, of course, the judgments you would take uh, faced with uh, the national crisis that we're in, of course. Um, how would I mitigate against my own faults? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I have found um, in the jobs that I've done is that uh, it's incredibly important to communicate with the people that you are responsible for. And I've said before that in the junior doctor's strike, I was doing the right thing, but I didn't get the message across as effectively as I needed to to junior doctors who are very hardworking people. So as Prime Minister, I, um, I will do social media very differently to how it's ever been done before. Because I think in this day and age, you need to be talking to the people that you're responsible for uh, the whole time. Not just at set piece occasions, You've, there's got to be constant contact. And uh, it's very easy to get busy and wrapped up in big matters of state and forget the need to communicate. So that's what I'll do. Does your opponent have faults? Um, look, uh, everyone's got faults. Um, but I, don't, I think it would demean this competition if we started pointing figures at each other because he could find just as many faults in me, I'm sure, if, if he looked. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I don't think we should go there. Okay. Uh, Another question, and this is coming from uh, Twitter. So thank you all to everyone so far for sending uh, your questions in. Again, use the hashtag AskTheNextPM. Dehenna says, how will you ensure that the North gets its fair share of government spending and of future economic growth? Well, this is really important because uh, the Conservative Party uh, wins the majority, of our the majority of seats in the South East, the home counties, the seats that I represent. Uh, but we can never form a government unless we win seats in the Midlands and the North. And on principle, if we are going to be the government of the United Kingdom, we have to be a government that wants to spread prosperity throughout the whole country. I've talked about HS2, but let me give you two other things. Northern Powerhouse Rail, I'm backing it, we'll do it. And I've said many times, I think our big opportunity is to be the world's next Silicon Valley. I think, you know, with our top universities, uh, with our tech entrepreneurs, we've got more of those than anywhere else in Europe, with our life sciences industries. It really could be Silicon Valley and Britain, the two great centers of tech innovation. And um, we've got a tech triangle, the London, Oxford, Cambridge triangle, but I will have a northern tech triangle as well, so that the north of our country also gets to benefit from that tech revolution. And what, it, what about um, specifically, Specifically on, on the Northern Powerhouse and rail in particular, what additional funding are you committed to? Well, I have looked at the funding for HS2, for Northern Powerhouse Rail, for the rollout of fibre optic uh, cable, which we need to do much more quickly than uh, the 2033 target that we've got at the moment. Um, and my fiscal rule is that borrowing will fall as a proportion of GDP over the economic cycle because we should not be racking up debts for future generations. And all these numbers are affordable within that envelope. Will some of these infrastructure projects fall by the wayside in the event of a no deal Brexit? Not if I'm Prime Minister, no. Because I think it's really important if we have an economic shock like that, uh, that we show confidence to the world and that we demonstrate that we are, we are going to be the most modern, dynamic, entrepreneurial economy. We're going to do these big infrastructure projects. I lived for a couple of years in Japan, and um, they had their first high-speed train between Tokyo and Osaka in 1964. It's two years before I was born. We're going to have ours in 2026. It'll be better than the Japanese one, but it will be a little bit late. And uh, I don't think we should make that mistake again. Um, back to Brexit now. Steve on Facebook is asking, would you support a unilateral reduction of tariffs post-Brexit to a free trading nation? This, of course, harks back to the ongoing row over GATT24, what a no-deal Brexit would mean and the different interpretations of it. Well, first of all, I think we've got to knock this GATT24 thing on the head. You can only get uh, an agreement not to introduce tariffs if both sides agree to that. So there isn't, 
I'm afraid there isn't a no deal route that would allow us to take advantage of GATT 24. But what your opponent has been saying. I'm not going to get drawn into those kinds of comments. And, and, I, and I certainly wouldn't say it's a lie because, you know, that, that suggests that someone is doing something deliberately. And I, I just don't think we should get into that discussion. But, uh, but it is factually the case that you need both sides to consent to um, Article 24 of GATT. But to answer your question, uh, what would I do in terms of tariffs? Well, we're a free trading nation. So I would never want to put up tariffs if we could possibly avoid it. I think it's, you know, if you look at the growth of other countries around the world, they've generally avoided tariffs. However, there are specific sectors which I think you need to look at carefully, um, you know, whether it's the ceramic sector or the farming sector, where on a temporary basis we might have tariffs just to make sure that the economic shock was mitigated. Okay. Uh, Litza on Facebook says, do you propose any reform to combat electoral fraud, for example, to prevent the abuse of the postal voting system? Um, we do need to combat electoral fraud, but the big innovation that we need, and uh, Brandon will probably kill me for saying this um, because I'm not sure what the Conservative Party's official position on this is, but we do need to find a way to introduce online voting because you know the whole world is going online. If we can bank online, if we can do our Christmas shopping online, if we can book our holidays online, surely we can find a way that is fraud proof to have online voting and that is the way the world is going and I think uh, that will encourage much more participation in our democracy. A uh, question about the fishing industry now. Anthony on Facebook, what are your plans to restore the UK fishing industry? Well I was in Aberdeen um, uh, and in fact the the largest white fish market in Europe on uh, on Sunday at the weekend um, and uh, it's, it's pretty impressive I have to say um, and when you talk to the fishing industry, uh, they say that Brexit is the biggest opportunity the industry has had for half a century uh, because uh, under the terms of the common fisheries policy, we only keep 40% of our catch. But independent coastal states like Norway keep 85% of their catch. And so it's a very big opportunity for us to leave the EU. Um, and so, you know, my, my pledge is that we will remain an independent coastal state and we will um, negotiate fishing, fishing quotas on an annual basis. And looking up to the armed forces now, do you think soldiers from the 1970s and 80s should face criminal prosecution for things that happened in, for example, Northern Ireland? Uh, no, I don't. And um, it's a very difficult issue. Um, and. I want to solve that issue because I've had constituents who've come and talked to me about it and uh, I think people who have served their country uh, coming to the end of their lives deserve our gratitude for their service. Um, but I, I don't want to pretend that there aren't difficulties in solving this issue. And the main thing, and I, I want to be honest about this, uh, you know, the peace in Northern Ireland was hard won, and under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, there is a need to treat both sides in the same way, however angry we may have felt about what happened. So this is a difficult issue to solve, but I absolutely do think that we need to get a better deal for our armed forces. Uh, this is a question from Jose on Twitter. In 2014, there was uh, just under 24,000 knife and sharp instrument offences, and in 2018, just under 40,000. And this year so far is looking to be at a record high. What will you do to reduce these numbers and gain control of the situation? Well, I think um, it's the right question to ask. Um, I do think the reduction in police numbers went too far. I think it's, it's very important that we as Conservatives and also it's important that folks at home watching understand the difficult decisions that we had to take in 2010 when we had the worst financial crisis since the Second World War. And because we took those difficult decisions and put the economy back on its feet, I was able to negotiate an extra £20 billion for the NHS in my last period as Health Secretary. So, 
so we were right to take those decisions, but in one or two areas, I think that with the benefit of hindsight, we can see it went too far, and the reduction in police numbers is one, and the social care system is another. So that is something I would look to change. There's been another question about that as well, about the impact on police morale, whether you accept the fact that morale is low as a result of that reduction, and whether you would make a commitment to numbers. I, I do make a commitment to increase police numbers. Uh, I'm not going to give an answer on air now, because I think it's something that the needs, work needs to be done. But, but yes, I, as I said, I think we went too far on that. Um, Darren on Twitter, again, has said, um, what was the most significant thing you learned from being a uh, foreign secretary that you think you would take then into the role of prime minister? Well, was foreign secretary, obviously, going into the role of prime minister. I think in foreign policy, uh, you always have to balance up the need to be friendly with other countries with the need to be tough in standing up for British interests. And I think I knew this in theory before, but I've seen it in practice um, as Foreign Secretary. And you know, when I was Health Secretary, I made it my mission to listen to patients, uh, as well as to the doctors and nurses who do such a great job, but to make sure as the elected representative, I was always listening to the people who were using the NHS. And that's why I try as Foreign Secretary to listen to people like Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe's husband, Richard, um, the families of people who've got loved, loved ones in other countries. And, and you know, let's be clear, um, there will be a diplomatic price to be paid for countries that don't treat our citizens properly. And that is, I'm afraid, not the only example across the world. Uh, this will probably be the final question then. This is Alexis on Facebook. Lots of questions have come in about um, social care and this is no different. When are county councils going to take mental health seriously in the education setting and provide suitable education? Uh, and uh, ch she adds that children are being failed through the lack of provision to meet their needs right now. Well, I will never forget as health secretary um, getting a letter um, from a, a father who whose daughter, teenage daughter, had killed herself. Um, I obviously won't say any names, and I won't even say the part of the country. Uh, but what was sad was that uh, this daughter was known to us in the NHS, but we hadn't spotted the degree of risk that she was at uh, with, with really tragic consequences. And when I looked into this and started to try and understand the issues around mental health better, uh, I discovered that nearly half of all mental health conditions are established before the age of 14. So the real trick with mental health is to catch these conditions early. Um, so I set up a program uh, when I was health secretary that said we're going to have mental health support in every secondary school in the country. Um, that is going to mean employing uh, an extra 19,000 people. It's going to take time to train those people up. So it's not going to be an overnight solution. But if we did that, we'd be the first country in the world to really say that we're taking children's mental health seriously. And as part of that, we've got to encourage people to talk about it. Because the other thing I learned is that if we all feel low from time to time, it's a totally normal thing. But if you don't say anything to your friends and the people around you, they can't help you. And, and that's something that we've all got to change as a society. Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> your time is up. <laughs> Jeremy Hunt, thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one candidate down, one still to come. Obviously, Boris Johnson will be making his way through uh, very shortly. Um, we are still streaming, as I understand it, live on Facebook on the Conservatives page. And you can also still watch this on Twitter as well. Um, a couple of announcements just to make. Um, if if uh, we haven't had a chance, I haven't, haven't had a chance to ask your question uh, tonight and you want to say something that's perhaps a bit more detailed as well, you still can. You can go to views.conservatives.com uh, forward slash leadership and you can then, of course, let the, the next Prime Minister know what matters most to you. So that address again uh, for those people who um, perhaps find that there isn't enough space in the comment box or I haven't had enough time to, to read out your questions. If you've got something more detailed to say, the address is views.conservatives.com forward slash uh, leadership. Now, as I said at the very beginning, this is um, a, a slightly different style hustings and we're going to get straight on with it with the next candidate now. Please welcome Boris Johnson. Thank you. Thank you.
good evening. Thank you, Hannah. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. It's great, great to, great to, to be here and, and, uh, and very exciting to join everybody who's watching online or by whatever means you're communicating with us. Listen, folks, uh, I, I think that I'm the right person to unleash on this particular project uh, uh, now because our party clearly is uh, facing a crisis. We're losing votes both to uh, the new Brexit party and to the Liberals. I've never known us to be down on, on 17 points in the polls. I've never known an election when we scored only 19 uh, it was nine points it was in the European elections. So we need to do three things and we need to do them well. Number one, we need to come out of the European Union on October the 31st and we need to get it done. And uh, I, I would respectfully say that we need somebody who believes in that project, who's campaigned on that project for that project for, 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 uh, for many years and uh, who knows how to get a good deal out of, uh, out of Brussels. And it is absolutely vital that we prepare for a no deal outcome if we're going to get the deal that we need. And I don't think that's where we're going to end up. I think it's a, a million to one against, but it is vital that we prepare. And I think actually that's, that's agreed amongst everybody uh, standing in this, or the last two people standing in this, uh, in this contest. Number two, we need to unite our, our party and unite our country. And in a nutshell, what I would like to do is bring uh, the whole country together in the way that I think I was able to bring London together. If you look at the, where London was uh, 11 years ago when I became mayor, people talked about a tale of two cities, and we lifted the whole place up. It was people at the bottom of society, the bottom quartile, who actually saw their life expectancy increase uh, the fastest, uh, and we did it through infrastructure, uh, through cutting crime massively, which we did, uh, boosting education and using new, new technology. And that is the formula. That is the way uh, we should be bringing our whole country together. And I want to raise education funding. I want to put in fantastic infrastructure uh, across the north, across the Midlands, uh, Wales, uh, the southwest. There's a huge amount that we can do. And of course, uh, a, a policy that I'm delighted has now also become common ground. We should massively accelerate full fiber broadband uh, for the entire country. It is a disgrace. There are, there are parts of, there are pueblos in Spain where they have better access to, uh, to uh, full fiber than we do uh, in, in, uh, in whole towns in, in the UK. Lastly, but most importantly, we want to get ready, we want to mobilize our party, uh, our country, uh, get ready uh, to fend off. And I don't want an early election at all. I want to keep going for as long as we possibly can, but then we must get ready to defeat Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party, who would be an economic and political disaster for Britain. I would just remind you that the last time I had to face an emanation of the London Labour left in an election, uh, we, our party, were 17 points behind in London when we came from behind and defeated Ken Livingston. We did it then, we can do it again, and I hope with your support that we will. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, Thank please. You. So over to our online audience now, and I'll start with the same question that I started with your opponent, with Jeremy Hunt. Um, th this is from Clovis in face uh, on Facebook, and she says, how do you propose to unite all the countries in the UK after Brexit so that the union stays together? Well, uh, thank you. I think that uh, it's a, a crucial question. It's often asked, and uh, particularly people ask of Scotland, and they say, wouldn't the, Sc the, the Scottish people, the Scots, be more likely to break away? And I say, on the contrary, Hannah, they'd be less likely to break away because actually if you do Brexit sensibly and effectively, you, you take away so much of the ammunition of the, of, of the SNP because after all, are, are they really going to want to rejoin the European Union, uh, to join the Euro, to join Schengen, to submit Scotland to all the full panoply of, of European uh, laws, an independent country? Of course they're not. As with all the problems and complexities that were set up with in their relations with England, of course they're not. And actually, get do Brexit done right, I think we can cement and uh, intensify the union. And uh, funnily enough, there are things that you, you need to do on coming out of the, uh, out of the EU to legally to underpin the whole UK single market. And uh, we will use every opportunity to strengthen the union, not just with Scotland, but also obviously uh, with Northern Ireland as well. Charlotte on Facebook says, would you involve Nigel Farage in any negotiation with the EU? Uh, I believe, as a matter of policy, and when, when it comes to fighting other parties, uh, which I've been doing for a very long time in the name of the Conservative Party, don't give them the oxygen of publicity. 
Uh, that's you know so and that works. I didn't, when I I think when I was fighting, story? it's it's a pretty clear no. Uh, when I was when I was fighting, <laughs> when I was when I it, absolutely not. Look when I was when I was fight, the second time I think I fought in London. I didn't. I'm not certain that uh, UKIP even stood against me. That what you do is you talk about what you're doing. We should be proud as conservatives of our agenda. We're going to take this country out of the European Union on October the 31st and fulfil the mandate of the people. That's what we're going to do. Uh, do. And in so doing, we will take the wind out of the sails of the, of the two other parties that I've mentioned uh, that have sprouted like puffballs, uh, saprophytically feeding off the decay in, in trust in politics at the moment. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to prick those puffballs, if that's what you do to a puffball. <laughs> and, and we're going to... Okay, we're staying with Brexit then. Um, Nuno on Facebook says... What will be your stance on immigration from other European countries and how hard will you work in order to prevent your immigration policies from being seen as xenophobic? Well, don't, for I mean, don't forget, folks, that when I was uh, mayor and indeed throughout my political career, I really don't think there's been any other mainstream Tory politician who has been so uh, strongly committed to our society being open to talent and open to immigration. Look at every single speech I ever made as mayor of London or indeed as foreign secretary. But I do think it should be controlled. And I do believe, therefore, that it is right to go for an Australian-style, points-based system so that the needs of the UK economy can be properly met. Yes, I do want talented people to be able to come here. And yes, I do want uh, the agricultural sector to be able to satisfy their requirements as well. It's incredibly important. But it's got to be done on the basis of a system of democratic control. And so what I would like to do is get the Migration Advisory Committee to look really properly at the Australian-style points-based system. Would you go as far as to secure the rights of EU citizens in the UK? Your opponent's just done that. Well, I think I said it the other night. I mean, I'm glad, that obviously, that so many policies are suddenly miraculously becoming a common ground between us, but that's, that's, that's good. These are acts of theft which we conservatives wholeheartedly condone. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely in favour of, of that. Uh, this is something that, frankly, we should have done three years ago. And actually, if you look at, if you look at Hansard for, the, I think, the Monday or the Tuesday after the referendum, I stood up behind the then Home Secretary in the, in the House of Commons and said that we should immediately make a supererogatory gesture to the 3.2 million, guarantee their rights in law uh, in the UK, just because that's the right thing to do. They've done it, they've, they contribute to our society, they're law-abiding people, uh, by and large, and, and they, deserve, they, they deserve that protection. Uh, lots of... Um... <laughs> Lots of questions coming in over the, the nature of your cabinet, should you become uh, Prime Minister. Alan has said on Facebook, will you appoint a passionate Brexit Chancellor to make sure the, tre the Treasury takes a more positive approach to well, Brexit? I, I certainly think that we want a government that takes a more positive approach. And let me, let me perhaps leave it to, uh, uh, at that, because I think it would be... Uh, I've made no... I should just say, I've made no promises to anybody about this, uh, about this question. Though. None to anyone at all. I haven't. I've been. I've been. I, 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 I learned a terrible lesson from three years ago. Uh, <laughs> I've made no. I've made no promises, whatever. And not that I made anybody then. Any then, but it got incredibly compl complicated. Uh, I, I've made no promises, and uh, I think that's the right way to to do it. But we will. Ha we will have a very talented government. I really believe this, and I can see lots of colleagues actually here in in, in this audience tonight. I don't think, in all the time I've been really following. Tory politics, there's ever been a time when there's been so much talent in the House of Commons on the Tory benches. I've, I've never known it. So there's a, there's a lot to choose from. I think you may, if have, I, if I, if I get that. You may have offered Ian Dale a cabinet position the other, on Saturday, but anyway, we'll, we'll go over that. Yeah, in yeah, a you will have to seek election first. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Rowan on Twitter says, as a young Conservative myself, how would you get young people to vote Conservative at the next general election? Uh, I, I think, number one, it's uh, about... Uh, Housing and, and, and home, home ownership, the prospect of home, home ownership. Number two, we've got to talk up the, uh, the incredible things that we're doing on, uh, on the environment. And uh, these are things that passionately engage young people. And I think the third point to remember is that, is that you know, in my experience, and I've been asked this question literally for the last 25 years, uh, young people really in the end they're going to they're going to want uh, all the same things 
they're going to want uh, good jobs, they're going to want economic progress. Uh, but there's one, there's one crucial thing that I think we can do to help young people to get there, and that is somehow to alleviate what I think is at the moment the, the uh, excessive burden of, of debt as a result of their university education. And uh, whether it's incurred as a result of their fees or their, or their maintenance costs, uh, we need to do something to help. Now, the solution may lie in the interest rate or it may lie elsewhere. Uh, I think we need to look at all of it, but we've got to do something because there's no doubt that uh, that, is, that is a key thing. But th there's a whole package of things we should be doing for young people. David on Facebook says, um, the UK was and still is in some areas a top level engineering powerhouse. What is your position on supporting engineering sectors which have been third place to say the financial and certain technology sectors? Well, I, I think that's a brilliant question and, and, and thank you because um, I, I agree with that. And this is, this is you know, the UK was the home of the first industrial revolution thanks to the, the, the innovative brilliance of, of British engineers. And they came up with solutions to things and they, they devised, you know, whatever it happened uh, to be. I mean, I think we've, I, I, I have a long list of things that were invented here from the, from the you know, theory of, of nuclear um, chain reaction to the machine gun, to, to you, you name it. It's all, it. it's all happened here. And it's still happening here. Uh, we are the world's leaders in battery technology. It's unbelievable. A, a fact I owe to a, to a, a colleague who told me about it a, a year ago. I didn't believe it, but it's true. So the 21st century motors, all the pioneering stuff is still going to be done in this country, you know, 200 years on. It's absolutely incredible. And, and what to promote that, uh, to promote engineers, we've got to do more for further education in this country and, and more for practical qualifications. Because, because Subjects as well. And to, oh, absolutely to encourage girls in, into STEM, and 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 we did a lot of that when I was uh, when I was mayor. Uh, we had a whole program to get uh, girls doing coding across the city because that that is fantastically important. Okay, um, back to Brexit now. Mitchell on Facebook says, Boris, if you cannot get a deal through Parliament before October thirty first to ensure a no-deal exit, would you call a general election or ask the Queen to dissolve Parliament? Look, uh, it would be absolutely crazy for any of us to think of going to the country, of calling a, a general election uh, before we get Brexit done. So if you can't get it through Parliament, what do you we, do? We'll do you get, suspend Parliament? Well, look, I, I think the, the first thing is to recognise that politics has changed since March the 29th. And I think colleagues do see that. We are facing not just... Uh, the Tory party, but also Labour, we're facing an existential threat. You know, we may be on 17 points, but they're on 19 points, and they managed, to, with heroic incompetence, to go backwards in the recent council elections, the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, we all need to get this thing done, and we need to, to move forward. And that's why I think that uh, they will want to get Brexit over the line on October the 31st, and, and then move forwards. And when that election comes eventually, I just remind you that I think we're gonna to need to be ready to wallop Corbyn for six. And I repeat my earlier point, I think I'm probably, and certainly best place to do it. If time is against you, which most would argue it, it is, if you become prime minister as far as Brexit is concerned, would you be con uh, consider um, suspending parliamentary recess, the summer recess? Well, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the uh, natural um, common sense of uh, my friends and colleagues uh, on, the, on, the, on the Tory benches and I also think that common sense is breaking out across the House of Commons. I think uh, we can get this thing done without having to resort to such a, a desperate expedient and I'm just looking at some of, uh, uh, of friends looking at me with what, what, what they call a wild surmise. <laughs> anxious about their summer yeah, holidays. No, I, 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 I think we can get this done, my friends, uh, without having to suspend uh, recess. There are a lot of uh, people who've, who have written in with questions asking specifically that in the real world, companies, when there's an existential crisis or any kind of crisis, holidays are cancelled. Why yes. doesn't that apply for MPs? Well, I think that maybe the answer to that question, very frankly, is that uh, I, I'm not convinced that Parliament can necessarily uh, sort out the problem uh, that Parliament has has helped to create. I think uh, perhaps more sittings of Parliament are not what we want. What we want is everybody coming together, coming together to 
in, in a spirit of in the spirit of responsibility, uh, collegiality, and let's get this thing done. Which does suggest though, that you, you're prepared to sort of bypass Parliament in order to get your deal through. No, I don't think I, I didn't. I didn't pick that up from what my answer. I was listening to it as I said it. It didn't, it didn't seem to me. It, it didn't seem to me that I said that at all. I, I mean, I know there is a look. I mean, there are some people who talk about. I think you're driving Hannah at this proroguing thing, right? Is that yeah, what you? Exactly. Is that what you want to come to? Uh, look, uh, I. That's what I was asking. Okay, so forgive me. Okay, look, I. You know, uh, I just re 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 returned to my earlier point. I think. Our, Colleagues really are starting to come together. They are thinking about this in a very mature and sober way. Uh, I am not attracted to um, archaic devices like proroguing. Let's get this thing done as, as proud members of a representative democracy that asked the people of this country a question that received a very clear answer, promised faithfully to uh, put that answer into effect, and, and now we've got to do it. Steve on, uh, Steve on Facebook says, would you support a unilateral reduction of tariffs post-Brexit to a free trading nation? Uh, I think that to any free trading nation, on the principle that that w is, is, you know, Adam Smith would say that that was the e economically sensible thing to, to do, I think we'd have to, to look at it. I think, I think we'd, I would be more interested, obviously, in a bilateral reductions. I, you know, if we're talking about non-EU countries, um, I think obviously we're going to want to do free trade deals with others and, w and the work will begin pretty much straight away on that. But I don't think we want uh, unilaterally uh, to, to lift our tariffs and, and, that, uh, and forego the opportunity to negotiate better access for, for UK firms to, to their markets. When you say the work will begin straight away, is that as soon as you enter 10 Downing Street, or is that on November the 1st? Well, uh, the, the, the work is actually, Liam, to be, to, be, to be fair, has already done a great deal of, of preparatory work in, in, insofar as he's been legally allowed to do it uh, under the doctrine, as you know, of sincere cooperation with the, with the EU. It's, it's been quite difficult for him to, to make much progress. Okay. Liam Fox, sorry, forgive me, Liam Fox, uh, Trade Secretary. Um, there is clearly... As soon as we come out, November the 1st, uh, legally, that's it. We take back control of our tariff schedules uh, in, uh, in Geneva. There are things that we can already start to, to do, we, and we can offer them in anticipation of the completion of that deal uh, with the EU. That's a fantastic moment for the, for the, for the United Kingdom. Uh, we should be proud of that. We should get going on that. And now, it will also mean uh, that we have to complete the FTA with the, the EU and, 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 and make sure that we've got to deal with them too. Okay. A Kath on Facebook says, please outline your housing policy, particularly with a view on the leasehold scandal. Well, I think that uh, we have too many people who simply uh, cannot get the housing they need. And I want to see uh, more housing, uh, more, more possibilities of home ownership for people across the country, particularly for for young people and so my policy on housing is to encourage uh, better more housing but not on green belt sites and I think it's very very important to be uh, clear about this I think I think we've had a, a lot of pressure uh, on the southeast of England to build homes uh, frankly in, in areas where it's caused a great deal of, of, of unrest and a lot of conservative uh, Good conservative councillors lost their seats in the in the recent uh, elections because of the protest against the rate of construction on the greenbelt. Now we've got to be very careful about what we do. I, I, the, the answer uh, is to use good transport infrastructure to liberate development on brownfield sites. That is that is the way to do it. And I, I would you know if, if you look at what we did at, at, at Vauxhall Battersea Nine Elms, uh, we were able to get huge developments going there by extending the northern line and if Sadiq Khan had any gumption at all he he would be going ahead now with Crossrail 2 which has the potential to generate that whole area Are you up to put a number on I think the conservative let, goal at the moment is something like 300,000 let me tell you Hannah in the lower Lee Valley alone you could build 200,000 homes on brownfield sites if you got 
uh, cross rail uh, two going. I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, but, you know, we're not building enough at the moment. That's the truth. But, but there, is, there are areas where you can do it. And, and just, if you, if you want a vision for the country and how we can take this country forward, we've got to recognize that there is huge pressure on housing and on the cost of housing in the southeast of England because we haven't got that, uh, that leveling up of the whole of the country. And if you put in be better infrastructure, and if you put in full fibre broadband, and if you increase the quality of education around the country, then you'll actually enable people who are currently migrating, leaving towns around the, uh, the UK to come to the great metropolis and come to the southeast, the most productive region in the whole of Europe. You'll enable them to make their lives, to raise their families, to start their businesses in those towns, and to bring jobs and growth to those areas. And that is what we should be doing. And if you look at what we did in London, I hate to, to bang on about this, but it is true. We were able, with great transport infrastructure, uh, and to diversify the, the, the hubs and the nodes of, of economic growth. And, and that's the way to do it. Lift up around the country. The specific question from Kath was, though, you, uh, can you outline your housing policy with a view uh, on the leasehold scandal? Well, uh, remind, me what, remind me what, if Catherine would explain what her exactly what you want She's to do. She just says, uh, Kath on Facebook says, please outline your housing policy, policy, particularly with a view on the leasehold scandal. So not so well, much about exactly, house building. I don't know exactly which leasehold scandal she's referring to, but if she, if she, if she, I will be happy to, to write to her. And, uh, okay. Um, Kath, you're going to get a personal letter. I will, Kath, I will, I will write to you and, and do my best to help. Fine. Stephen on Facebook, uh, this is on student loans, says, will the interest rate on student loans be reduced to base rate plus 0.5%? Well, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you could do. And... Uh, and well, I don't want to make a pledge now, but I've, I've, said, I've indicated earlier that uh, that is one of the areas where I think people are under particular pressure. Okay. Steve on Twitter says, I work in steel in the UK, where we face an enormously uneven playing field. Steel makers only, play, only pay half as much for electricity in France than they do in the UK. How would you level that playing field? I, I think that is a, a massive issue. And I think we need to look at the cost of electricity in this country. We need to consider whether uh, there are things we can do on state aids that are currently forbidden uh, by uh, EU rules and uh, there may be things we can do on procurement that are forbidden by OGU processes that would uh, enable us to help uh, steel companies uh, and, and uh, uh, to help uh, the workers at, at Scunthorpe. I mean, there, there may be things that we, we can do. I, 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 really, I really feel for what is going on there and I would certainly want to help. I asked this question to Jeremy Hunt as well. Uh, this is from Jim on Facebook. As you have both held the office of Foreign Secretary, what do you consider to be our greatest current international security threat? And what is our greatest international economic opportunity post-Brexit? Uh, uh, I think that the, the reality is that we face a, uh, a variety of, of different threats. Uh, we, we face clearly a, a security threat uh, from, uh, from terrorism, uh, which results from is, is generated by uh, associated with an arc of instability uh, in the in the in the Middle East, uh, run, running through to, to South Asia. Uh, we clearly face uh, a real problems uh, in it with from our relationship with uh, with Russia and uh, the way Russia behaves, and uh, we need to to manage that. And it's it's very very difficult. And um, I was very proud that. Uh, when I was uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, we faced a very serious challenge when the, the Skripal poisoning took place in, in Salisbury. And uh, we were tasked with trying to persuade uh, other countries to support the UK by expelling uh, Russian spies. And um, they did, to, to a degree that we really found quite extraordinary. And they... Uh, we thought we'd get about 30 expelled. Actually, we got about uh, 153 uh, from 28 countries around the world. What do you make of recent reports that uh, allege that certain cabinet members are saying that you yourself would be a security threat as prime minister? Um, well, you know, uh, I think the great thing about this, uh, this campaign is that uh, my, the maxim I've tried to, to follow is, you know, Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, Never speak ill of a fellow conservative, and uh, I'm sure everybody, everybody, everybody will remember that. This is um, 
the question about knife crime. Graham says, what will you do as Prime Minister about the extremely worrying rise in knife crime, particularly in London? Uh, well, I've just, you know, I hesitate to remind you of this, Hannah, but I'm going to. Uh, and I, I, I see Nick Dubois and others who, who know, remember this well. Um, 11 years ago, when I began as Mayor of London, there was an absolutely uh, almost identical spate of, of knife crime in, uh, in our capital, and we were losing young kids, uh, teenagers, at, at the rate of about 30 a year. And I'll tell you what we did. We had a massive programme of stop and search. And we got the police out on the streets. We kept police numbers high. Uh, over, about, over a period of about a year, they took 11,000 knives off the streets of London. And do you know what? The murder rate, uh, serious youth violence came down by 32%. The crime overall came down by about 20%, but the, the, the murder rate came down by 50%. And that was, that was because we had a very proactive approach to policing. And if, I'm, if I may say, you've got to back the police. So if you ask me what I would do now, I would give the police what they call political top cover. Political top cover to do what they signed up to do. And, you know, to those who say that stop and search is, uh, is discriminatory or... Um, you know, uh, divisive, come on. Actually, I've talked to the mothers uh, of, of kids whose lives are at risk, and they want us yeah, yeah. to do this. I've talked to the mothers of victims. You know, for, for heaven's sake, there is actually nothing uh, more... When a kid is walking down the street with, with a, going equipped with a bladed weapon, there's nothing uh, more kinder or in, more loving than, than, that you can do than to ask him to produce that, that weapon and, and turn out his pockets. So it's almost invariably a, a, a him, of course. And, and that's the right thing to do. I want to ask you about the NHS. Um, the same question that Jeremy Hunt had as well. Nigel on Facebook says, do you believe in the NHS concept of treatment being free at the point of demand? I do. And are you concerned about totally. creeping privatisation? Uh, under my premiership, the NHS will be free to everybody at the point of use, of course. And that wouldn't change even with... Absolutely not. Particularly not in the event of a, some free trade deal with the United States. I, I was going to ask you specifically yeah. about the, the United States. Yeah. President Trump said that it was still I, on the I table. Knew, I knew you were going to say that. President Trump did say that it, the <coughs> NHS was off, still on the table. I, I think he... Uh, unless I miss my guess, I think the president that later retracted his remarks. Yeah. Did he not? Yeah. 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 Well, do, you, do you trust President Trump then? Well, I, 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 I certainly uh, can trust very much in, in, in the version B of what he had to say. <laughs> okay, final question then. Scott on Twitter says, how will you rebalance investment between the north and the south of, of uh, he says, of England? Yeah. Th that is the, the, the crucial question. And just get, get, get back to everything that I have been saying. Uh, I do think that we need to be in, I, I want to be the, uh, the prime minister who does not just for Midlands connectivity, but also for Northern Powerhouse Rail, what we did with uh, the tube upgrades and, and Crossrail for London, as I said, because it's so socially just. You're letting people on modest incomes commute easily to their place of work. It's a fantastic liberator. Transport is the great unsung liberator and engine of social justice. It really is. It really is. We should do that. But it's, it's, it's also a question of, uh, I, you know, as I say, of uh, investment in education, in, in technology, and, and recognising that you know, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of towns in the UK. Because the, London is, is brilliant. The big cities, the 12 core cities of the UK, are also starting to do brilliantly. But then there are about three or 400 towns where actually some are doing well, but some economically less well. Uh, and, and society is, is less happy. And that was part of the Brexit vote, don't forget. But there are things you can do. There are ways you can stimulate activity and, and ways you can uh, bring on uh, the uh, economic growth in those, in those areas. And uh, it, it's about infrastructure, it's about education, it, it's about technology, but it's also a bit about devolution and an inspiring local pride and initiative. And as Conservatives, we should be doing that as well. Boris Johnson, thank you very much. And thank you to all of the viewers who've been watching online. Tomorrow I will be with both candidates in Britain.
Bournemouth as the hustings continue. That's just available uh, for questions from the Conservative, Conservative Party membership. But remember, you can still continue to ask questions uh, to the Conservatives, to the candidates as well. Um, and you, the questions can go in slightly more length than I've had time to get through this evening. Views.conservatives.com forward slash leadership. And thank you so much for your contribution this evening.